so then I have to ask myself, okay, so if this is true, uh, why does uh, why is the uh, organ of hearing develop so early as opposed to other ones? Obviously, sight can wait because there's really not much to see. Uh, there may be, but there's no light to see it with. Uh, for that, we have to go back then into evolution. And, uh, and I could pose a question, and I'm free will at this point. I pose a question, how many of you have heard uh, sound that travels through a liquid medium. Oh. Yeah. When yeah. you're a kid, you go to a swimming pool, right? And your friend yells at you, and you try to hear it. So, well, you, but you also do realize that all the sounds you hear are uh, waves propagating through uh, a liquid medium, because our organ of hearing is liquid filled, and that's a, a vestige of, of of our development as a species, of course, because we all began as aquatic organisms, and the organ of hearing didn't develop as an organ of hearing as we know it. It develops, well, here's the Socratic part of the talk. What else does it do besides locate balance. Balance. sounds? Balance. balance, sure. It's extremely necessary for living in a three-dimensional uh, uh, aquatic environment. Uh, yeah, and so, uh, and when we, in, in, in utero, we're, probably, we're also aquatic organisms, of course, we're living in, in, uh, in liquid. And so, that's a vestige there. And you know, when I think about it, I think, wow, that is really, that's a really good thing that that happens. Because if you know something about how uh, waves propagate through a medium, which you do, <laughs> because I'm talking to people that know way more about it than I do, but I know a little bit, and I, I know uh, the difference between how how the power of an acoustic wave uh, can travel through air as opposed to not just any liquid, but you know the, uh, the liquid in the inner in the organ of Corti is fairly viscous also. So there's a big impedance uh, uh, factor with uh, with these mechanical waves traveling through. The liquid, and, and that's really good because uh, I can't imagine what kind of organ we'd have to develop to deal with the unimpeded uh, waves propagating through air, for example. The organ of Corti, the, the, the cochlea, the inner ear, the organ of hearing is very, very small and very, very delicate. And uh, ultimately, of course, uh, the detection of sound and the analysis of sound begins there with even smaller organisms, the, the hair cells. Uh, and uh, you, you can imagine, you know, it would be like gale-forced winds hitting uh, blades of grass uh, if, uh, if we didn't have the nice impedance factor of the, uh, of the viscous liquid inside our inner ears. So that's kind of neat that that happened. And, uh, uh, and the way that the whole the whole thing uh, works. So we have uh, sound waves that travel through air, and of course, then they they're they're funneled through our auditory meatus, and they impinge upon our tympanic membrane, which then converts one form of mechanical energy into another. Because as the tympanic membrane vibrates back and forth in response to the pressure waves hitting it, uh, it'll move in turn three interlocking little bones that will pull another membrane back and forth on the other side is that liquid and that will induce pressure waves in the liquid and of course those waves will travel around the little spiral uh, mechanism of the cochlea you know, which is lined with hair cells and, and eventually that decoded sensation is sent to the eighth auditory nerve, the eighth cranial nerve and hits the brain to determine what to which, what happens next. And there's another reason that, that sound uh, develops so early because uh, the, the real purpose of hearing and the real purpose of hearing in three dimensions with two ears is uh, to uh, survive. It's a survival mechanism. Um, whether you're in the water or on land, but particularly in, on land, uh, it works. It works very well for locating, uh, uh, <coughs> locating direction and distance of a predator or of prey. Um, 
if we hear a sound, a sudden sharp sound, we react. And that's because the very first thing that happens is our brain has got to determine where's that sound coming from? Is it a threatening sound? Should my reaction be a flight or fight reaction? I think the piece is here. I'm not, a, hey, is this like, it's like a cure for cancer or a faster than light drive or something? Or can I erase it? <laughs> from the side. I'm sure you're, that's what that is. That's a spinal cord right there, okay? Uh, but I'm sure you all, you, you all know about this, that we have this kind of hodgepodge brain um, uh, consisting of the, uh, the, uh, the hind brain and the brain stem and then the, uh, the uh, hippocampus and the, the mammal brain and then the human brain up here. And when the, when the when sound is processed, it comes from the cranial nerve it's going to hit there and make its way up there for further processing. And so, yeah, our emotional centers are hit first, whether it's music or any other kind of sound, it starts there. So whether it's the sound of the Tyrannosaurus Rex roaring at us when we were at Jurassic Park, and we figure out it's over there, I'm running there. Uh, or our perhaps evolving mammalian ancestors did. Uh, that's an important thing. Uh, it's also, uh, so that, and that's an emotion, that's uh, fear. Uh, on the other hand, if we hear a mating call coming from there, we head there, and, uh, and that's another emotion, and so on. So sound is first processed at the lowest level of the brain, and, and so on. Unfortunately for most people, that seems to be where it stops these days. Uh, and, and, and I don't mean to be a culture snob, but I've worked in the, in the pop music industry and in the record business for many years, and I have become a culture snob because I understand what corporate music America has done to you and me. And <laughs> uh, uh, when, when we go to a concert, for the most part, the music is specifically designed to entertain that area of the brain and nothing else. And it's at the point now where most people, when they hear music that aspires to do more than that, they're uncomfortable with the entire notion. They don't like it, it bothers them, it makes them think, it annoys them, and so on. And nothing is more illustrative of that than the fact that when we go to a concert, a popular music concert, everything is here to diminish the auditory experience. We're not, nobody cares about trying to make the music crystal clear. They want to make it loud, they want to make it bottom heavy so that you can experience it through your bottom as well as through your ears. <laughs> if you push enough, if you push enough uh, air molecules around, you're going to feel it physically as well. And then there's the communal experience, of course, of, of being with all those other warm bodies pushed close together, yelling and screaming and, and partaking of controlled substances. And that's not listening. <laughs> and that's not in, in, you know, the so-called music that's being generated for those experiences. Is doesn't really fit my ideal of what music is. It's, 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 it's nice, it's fun, it's, it works for what it is, but unfortunately what's happened is that uh, there are very few choices beyond that. Even those of you, and, and you know, if you listen to Katri, you hear all this wonderful variety of music, but to a trained musician such as myself, it's almost all the same. When I hear uh, music enthusiasts uh, wax prolix about the difference between this group and that group, and that style and this style and everything else, then I hear the music, I instantaneously recognize that it's Musically, the same. The biggest differences are primarily hairstyles, wardrobe, attitude, posture, and the like. 